For our reading, we will take passage from the Apocalypse of St. John. After these things, I looked up and behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard, as it were, of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must be done hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, there was a throne set up in heaven, and upon the throne one sitting. And he that sat was to the sight like the jasper and the sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats four and twenty ancients sitting, clothed in white garments, and on their heads were crowns of gold. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and voices and thunders, and there were seven lamps burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And in the sight of the throne was, as it were, a sea of glass like to crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes before and behind. Words from the Apocalypse of St. John. Now we've talked about the need to practice for heaven and how powerful heaven comes to the aid of those who do train with a sincere heart. But what is heaven? In its essence, heaven is seeing God face to face, the creator of all things. When you have the creator, you have everything. You will lack nothing. Heaven is God, a trinity of divine persons. Heaven is a divine society. Pope Leo XIII, writing about the trinity, He said, this dogma, the mystery of the blessed Trinity, is called by the doctors of the church, the substance of the New Testament. That is to say, the greatest of all mysteries, since it is the fountain and origin of them all. In order to know and contemplate this mystery, Pope Leo writes, the angels were created in heaven and men upon earth. What are you made for? To know and love the Trinity. He goes on, for this is the Catholic faith, that we should adore one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity. Thank you, Pope Leo. So heaven is seeing and adoring the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Heaven is possessing God and being possessed by God. Heaven is our final end, the church triumphant, a society. Underline that word, a society, a community. First and foremost, in God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And second of all, among all those whom he made to know him and love him and serve him. Angels and men, saints. The prophet Daniel describes this in a vision of heaven. He says, thousands and thousands ministered to him, and 10,000 times 100,000 stood before him. St. Paul says, you are come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the company of many thousands of angels, and to the church of the firstborn, who are written in the heavens, and to, to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the just made perfect. Thus, the first object of the virtue of hope, the theological virtue of hope, is God himself. But the second object is the joys of heaven. And part of that joy is being in a society, being with others, being with the saints. In heaven, everyone knows each other through God. Everyone faces God, and through Him, they know all things that pertain to their fellow man in heaven. We will be intimate friends. They can speak to their neighbor, not by turning to their neighbor, but by speaking through God to their neighbor. They know what is going on down here and what to pray for through God. They can't, as it were, say, just a minute, God, let me look down into the earth. Hey, look at that. They're not going to do that. Only they'll see everything through God. 
And put a bookmark there because we're going to come back to that. This structure of heaven is important because so many today want to run away and hide from the wrath of God that is upon us. Thus, there are a variety of survivalists and so-called preppers. Seems clear to me this path is not practicing for heaven. At the end of time, those that believe and have been faithful, His Majesty instructs them to do what? Look up, look up and be proud that you're a believer. Here are His words. He says, but when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is at hand. Yet those who have failed to practice doing all the things that God has asked in accord with this holy law will seek to flee and hide and try to make the mountains cover them. Thus, he says, men withering away for fear and expectation of what shall come upon the whole world. For the powers of heaven shall be moved. The book of Leviticus speaks of it like this. He says, you shall flee when no man pursueth you. Frankly, I think that covers a lot of people today. They feel like someone's pursuing them and watching them and they run for it to some hole in the ground. No one's pursuing them. Let's not be like these people. This is not the path the saints take. Never has it been. If they do go to a cave, it is to pray and prepare for bigger battles. The third secret of Fatima comes to mind where it indicates how the evil coming into a head in our times will be overcome by the faithful going up the mountain together. It's on the Vatican website. You can see the secret. Read it yourself. They're going up as a group, as a society, being led by the Holy Father. And then by bishops and cardinals. And then by priests and religious. And then by nobility and laymen, all in ranks and orders. They go up the mountain to the cross at the top. And together they're martyred. As St. Catherine of Siena said, martyrdom makes the church young. And so the angels are there gathering the blood and pouring it upon the world and converting it. The blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians, the fathers tell us. Heaven is a society. In heaven, we will live with those not of our choosing. This is a key element of heaven. You cannot choose who's going to go there. Heaven, we live with those not of our choosing, but nevertheless, everyone is perfectly happy. Charity is the bond of perfection. They love each other perfectly there in that sea of love. Charity in heaven is somewhat, somewhat like blood is to a family on earth. Or maybe the vows and the religious rule is to a community. Attempted to run. Many are. Stock up on guns and ammo. Find a hole to wait out the storm. Using our guiding principle, I would say that's the wrong way. Starting in heaven and working backwards, we see this is not the route to take. This is not true prudence. We are in this together and we must win together, not on our own. Let's not run away, but help each other. And it will be worth it. St. John Bosco gathered many boys around him to train them to be good citizens. To overcome the world. How? He had them first attend Mass and pray the rosary together and go to confession regularly. He demanded that that be a regular part of their daily life. He wanted them first and foremost to be good citizens of heaven. And then they would be good citizens of earth ever seeking to build up the body of Christ in whatever capacity that fit them best. He trained them to deal with life's difficulties, even conquer them, not flee from them. There's a beautiful 17th century saint of Quito, Ecuador, named Saint Mariana, the lily of Ecuador, the lily of Quito. She wanted to enter religious life, but it was not God's holy will. At that time, Quito, like any other big city, had numerous problems and plenty of scoundrels. She looked upon the city and understood its needs, its sins. 
Perhaps it was shown her much. Much was shown her by supernatural revelations about the sins of the city. Instead of running away from it, she offered herself in sacrifice to bring about its redemption and salvation. The blood shed from her multiple penances, her servant would gather up and pour into the garden and lilies would spring up there. She later gave away her home to become a Carmelite monastery. God must have heard her prayers because much good has come forth from Quito. And she has inspired many holy souls since. Thank you, St. Mariana, for practicing for heaven and not running away. In the same city around the same time lived another Mariana, a Conceptionist nun. She was among the foundresses of the Conceptionist convent in Quito, the first to arrive there, the first convent to be made. As we made mention yesterday, every convent is supposed to be an antechamber to heaven, a place where heaven is played out daily. At this time, however, there was a sister in this convent that fomented a rebellion. Because of her leadership role, she comes down known to us simply as El Capitan. She won over most of the sisters and had a number of the foundresses and their supporters, including Venerable Mother Mariana of Jesus Torres, the very visionary of Our Lady of Good Success. She had her and the other nuns imprisoned for some time in the monastery, fed them on bread and water, and treated them as prisoners are treated. After all was finally straightened out, the good sisters were released. Venerable Mother Mariana learned that the El Capitan would be damned for her evil, rebellious actions, her diabolical rebellion, unless Mother Mariana suffered five years of hellfire to save her soul. It doesn't take much to figure out. She did it. She did suffer the hellfire. For five years. To bring glory to God and to save a fellow soul, she agreed to it. Heaven is a society. We are to help each other get there. We do not choose who goes there. In except we can suffer and die for someone. Like St. Maria Goretti did. I have at times heard some preachers, I believe wrongly, state in their sermons, especially those sermons that have to do with difficult moral problems. They'll state things like this, Oh, I'm not going to hell for you. They make this disclaimer because it excuses them from all the hard things they're about to say, often in a rather blunt manner. But wait a minute. Does this disclaimer sound right to you? It ought not. Your faith should be alarmed at such a statement. I cannot find a single saint who said anything like it. Instead, I find Moses asking God to blot him out of the book of life if he would not save the people he brought out of Egypt. Those stiff-necked people down in the valley blot me out of the book of life instead of damning those people. Damn me instead. That's what Moses did. And it worked. He saved those people from immediate destruction. St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans that he would willingly be damned for his fellow Hebrews if only they could be saved. Our Catholic sense ought to tell us this rather blunt statement is not quite right, but rather selfish. Heaven is a society. It's not about just me and Jesus, my personal Savior. The Carmelite nuns of Compiègne offered their lives in sacrifice to quell the terror of, of the enlightened, evil, diabolic French Revolution. God heard their cry and answered their prayer. The time had arrived. They had offered themselves some years earlier. And then when the time arrived for the reign of terror, when it was at its peak, drinking in the blood of the French, by divine providence, almost by miracle, they were able to wear their Carmelite habits 
and brown scapulars to the guillotine on July 17, 1794. Everyone knew who they were. Unlike the other executions, all were silent before these nuns. These beloved servants of our Lord and Our Lady, the nuns did heavenly things all the way to the guillotine. They chanted their office and they sang hymns, most especially the Salve Regina, as they made their way to the guillotine. This is no easy task. Fear is paralyzing. Upon seeing this mechanical altar set up for death, they chanted the Deum. Unheard of. They joyfully, even manfully mounted the scaffold, unlike so many others who had died with them and before them. They were glad to be on Calvary. The nuns practiced for heaven and heaven came to their assistance. The terror ended ten days later, the length of a novena with the death of Robespierre. Heaven is a society. We are to work at this together. The Fatima children often wanted to run away from the crowds and intrusive, inquisitive people seeking them. For the salvation of souls, however, they often decided against fleeing and spoke with them. And it was not an easy decision. St. Bernadette had the identical problem in Lourdes. Heaven is a society. You cannot practice heaven by running away. What is more, all these saints tasted something of heaven's joy because they learned the secret of heaven, putting God first and putting the good of the neighbor before themselves. Thus, the word joy itself indicates this. J stands for Jesus. We put God first in all things, as St. Paul indicates. All whatsoever you do in word or in work, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. O stands for putting others second. His majesty said, greater love than this no man hath, than he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do the things that I command you. And why is putting yourself last of all? Those who follow this pattern, they put charity in the order of J-O-Y, find that peaceful joy enters their hearts despite all they may suffer in this life. A joy that no earthly wine or pleasure can match. In his rule for religious life, that is how to practice for heaven, St. Augustine gives us an indicator of when we are making progress at this ordering. Namely, when we place the common good above the private good. There it is. When we place the common good of others, of the whole ahead of the private good. In other words, we place the whole over the part. Listen to what he says. For love, as it is written, is not self-seeking, meaning that it places the common good before its own, not its own before the common good. Know then that the more you devote yourselves to the community rather than to your own private interests, the more you have advanced. Saints love the whole church in God and the individual as a part of the whole or at least a potential part of the whole in God. When we look at some evil person, someone who has deeply wronged us, wronged our family, wronged our church, wronged our city, wronged our country, if only we can scrape away the evil and see that they are indeed potentially a member of the whole of the church in heaven, purified of all evil, they can more readily deal with them and practice for heaven in this life and do the right thing. On the other side of things, we can also note that particular friendships, friendships that distract one from God, can block out playing for heaven. Can block out our playing heaven. True friends lock arms and walk toward God, loving each other as though in and through God, as saints do in heaven. That's what friends do. They lock arms and they put their focus on God, not on each other. Everyone in heaven, they're intimate friends. 
Is there not someone you want to see or meet in heaven? They're intimate friends, and you'll be friends too. Heaven, therefore, is a society. The church triumphant, the Catholic church, the mystical body of Christ come to completion. That's what heaven is. Yet heaven being a sea of love or divine charity, some will claim that all we really need then is love. Maybe you've seen signs that say, all we need is love. Maybe you've heard speakers playing overhead a song that keeps repeating over and over. All you need is love. Sad to say, many, and maybe, (laughs) hurts to say this, maybe we have heard this from some pulpit somewhere in the church too. All you need is love. This repeated theme should not be something new to us, as many have been slouching in this direction for some time. For example, Helen Keller wrote in her autobiography, The Story of My Life, way back in 1902, how she met with the Episcopal Bishop of Massachusetts, Philip Brooks. She recounts once when I was puzzled to know why there were so many religions. He said, there is one universal religion, Helen, the religion of love. Love your heavenly father with your whole heart and soul. Love every child of God as much as ever you can. And remember that the possibilities of good are greater than the possibilities of evil. And you have the key to heaven. Bishop Brooks taught me no special creed or dogma. Bishop Brooks taught me no special creed or dogma. But he impressed upon my mind two great ideas, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man and made me feel that these truths underline all creeds and forms of worship. God is love. God is our Father. We are His children. Since Bishop Brooks has died, I have read the Bible through. Also some philosophical works on religion, among them Swedenborg's Heaven and Hell. And I have found no creed or system more soul-satisfying than Bishop Brooks' creed of love. Now, if there is no special creed or dogma required, as Helen Keller says, and Bishop Brooks told her, how is it then that the faith is what cures people according to His Majesty, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? He repeatedly healed man and said, it's your faith that has cured you. Faith is about truth. Let's see now. Helen Keller was an active socialist, worked for women's rights, promoted birth control, helped to found the ACLU in 1920, as well as promoting the occult-based writings and beliefs of Emanuel Swedenborg. She believed in universal salvation, where even the devil is reconciled to God in the end. In other words, hell's just a purgatory, and everybody's going to get out. Later in life, she wrote, In Swedenborg's teaching, since God's life cannot be less in one being than another, which is erroneous, or his love manifested less fully in one thing than another, again, that's erroneous, his providence must needs be universal. He has provided religion of some kind everywhere. (laughs) Imagine that. God has provided religion of some kind everywhere. And it does not matter to what race or creed anyone belongs if he is faithful to his ideals of right living. (laughs) I hope this sounds familiar. Any religion will do. God has provided them all. All you really need is love. And this means love takes precedence over truth, over doctrine, over dogmas. This effectively makes truth relative. Of course, this is false. This is erroneous. This is an inversion. This is from hell. This is the occult speaking. Swedenborg was an occultist. Seeking the secrets of the universe and looking down for the answers. That's what it means to be an occultist. According to John Sr., John Sr., uh, professor at KU, uh, Kansas University, he did a survey of occult principles before he converted to the faith back in the early 60s. 
Those under the sway of the underworld, he said, hold this. The universe is animate. The universe is taken to be, in fact, a living man. Teilhard de Chardin basically taught the same thing. In other words, the universe is, as it were, the body of God. The universe is, as it were, God. One dedicated follower of Chardin sums up the master's erroneous theology thus. For Teilhard, Christ today is not just Jesus of Nazareth risen from the dead, but rather a huge, continually evolving being. Each of us lives and develops in consciousness in this being, living cells in a huge organism. At various times, theologians have described this great being as the total Christ, the cosmic Christ, the whole Christ, the universal Christ, or the mystical body of Christ, which is blasphemy. This is very relevant to what I'm telling you, given what is often spoken out now, spoken out loud, now even from inside the church herself, by some of her members high and low. For example, we heard recently, the pluralism and the diversity of religions are willed by God. That's nothing new, as I just proved to you. The gospel says something very different. It says this, For God so loved the world as to give his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him may not perish, but may have life everlasting. We believe in the Son to be saved from perishing eternally in hell. We must believe in Him. Not every religion will do then. You must believe in the Son. It's not just about God the Father. Here we go. Let's go on. St. John says in another place, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. Again, he says, Whosoever revolteth, and continueth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. Obviously, not all religions are going to work. How is this going to reconcile with what Helen Keller said from Bishop Brooks? It doesn't. St. Paul says, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Let him be set outside. Let him be separated. So in order to have the love of the Father, we must first believe in and then love the Son of God become man, as well as persevere in his doctrine. What is more, the same Son of God tells us this, if anyone love me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and we will make our abode with him. And he that loveth me not keepeth not my words. In another place, we hear him say, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. When the rich young man came to his majesty asking, good master, what shall I do that I may have everlasting life? To which he responded, if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal, and so on. When one loves God, he will not commit adultery. He will not choose abortion, no matter what. He will hold only one man for one woman in holy matrimony. These are things our Lord taught us. This is surely one of the reasons why St. John repeats himself in his letters that we must always, quote-unquote, love in truth. Love in truth. This means dogma, doctrine, and the one true religion do matter. They are the prerequisite for true love. Heavenly love, love that saves and unites to God the Father and all the saints and angels in heaven forever and ever. And this is why we say in a purposeful sequence in the catechism, God made us first and foremost to what? Know Him. Then comes to love Him. Then comes to serve Him. Then comes in order to be happy with Him forever in heaven. This is why St. Paul uses a specific order in saying, and now there remain faith, hope, 
and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. But faith comes first. We have to believe. St. Paul says elsewhere, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible to love God without faith. Faith as a gift from God to believe all that he has revealed. And no picking and choosing with faith. No faith, no love that is truly heaven. No, no faith that's given by heaven. No love that's going to make it to heaven. You may have love, but it won't save you. The more faith, the more love. Besides, how can anyone really love someone or something of which they know nothing of? God reveals himself and we conform. We cannot pick and choose as do the heretics. In a rapture, his majesty spoke to St. Teresa of Jesus as following. All the harm that comes to the world comes from its not knowing the truths of scripture in clarity and truth. All the harm that comes to the world comes from its not knowing the truths of Scripture in clarity and truth. Alas, daughter, how few there are who truthfully love me. Do you know what it is to love me truthfully? It is to understand that everything that is displeasing to me is a lie. To complement this, Father Frederick Faber, the great oratorian of London, explains that there is something hated in heaven. Heresy, sin, and error are hated in heaven. Think about it. There is hatred in heaven. There is? Of what? Here's what he says. I beg of God in his infinite compassion to keep alive in me to the last hour of my life the intense hatred of heresy with which he has inspired me and which I recognize as his gift. I beg of him to make it grow in me to an abhorrence far greater than it is yet. That's practicing for heaven, folks. Hatred of heresy. He goes on. Heaven is the land of love, but the hatred of heresy will not diminish there. For the hatred of heresy is the adoring love of God's ever-blessed truth. Thank you, Father Faber. There is only one church in heaven, and it is the Catholic Church. The mystical body of Christ come to full stature. It is not the occult concept It is not the mystical body of the universe in which all are saved. To say that there is only one church established by God is the same as saying heaven and the church triumphant are coextensive. Where one is, there's the other. In other words, everyone in heaven is Catholic. Heaven is the final home of Catholicism. This makes perfect sense because there's only one bridegroom and only one bride. One faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. Now working backwards then, we can see that just as there is only one church in heaven, there's only one church, one true religion willed by God on earth. It can only be this way. He may permit other religions, but he himself only directly wills one religion, the one he revealed, the one that is alive and cannot be put to death, the one that is the mystical body of Christ. It is the same church in her battle to gain the victory. The church militant. If you want to go to heaven, you have to enter his holy Roman Catholic church. Thus, St. Augustine These profound words. This is Augustine. This is way back. He says, no man can find salvation save in the Catholic Church. Amazingly, he says, outside the Catholic Church, he can find everything save salvation. He can have dignities. He can have the sacraments. He can sing the Alleluia and answer Amen. He can accept the Gospels. He can have faith in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And he can preach it too. But never, save in the Catholic Church, can he find salvation. 
hard to get around those words from the doctor of grace, the greatest of all the fathers. Now, it seems to me the occult has risen up and provided new ways around this, this dogma. Popular idea today that is often repeated in books, movies, and talks is this. There is life on some planet out there in the universe around us. So all these planets out there, and there's life there. That there are other rational beings like us. Aliens, Martians, Star Wars, Star Trek. Are not alien beings among these places saved as well? Are we so prideful to think that we're all there is? I've been told that a number of times. This seems like maybe a silly thing to address in a mission conference, but it is not, I assure you. This idea is an attempt to undermine what we have just presented to you. Over the last centuries, intensified especially over the 20th century, the scientific community has made many attempts to demote mankind from being the apple of God's eye. I guess Proverbs got it wrong when it said, My delight is to be with the children of men. We must be just another race of beings in the universe. Thus, Carl Sagan stated, We live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star, lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of the universe, in which there are far more galaxies than people. We're really not that important after all, it seems. Are we being arrogant and thinking that we are? That the church is built on this rock, this terra firma. That we have the Pope and so on, the vicar of Christ. Some of these efforts have been aimed at God too, since evolution is the underlying philosophy. Evolution eventually leads to atheism. This battle is still very much alive and even raging in various ways across our country and world. I own two diagrams from the National Geographic Society, one of the solar system and one of the universe, as modern scientists propose them to be. One of them is entitled, The Solar System, Our Sun's Family, S-U-N. And then it reads in the caption, you get a load of this, makes you want to, you know, get sick. It says, born... In the darkness of interstellar space, some 4.6 billion years ago, our solar system emerged from a contracting molecular cloud of dust and gas. Born contractions? What a mockery. The other is is entitled, The Universe, Nature's Grandest Design. No mention of any creator. Instead, a denial of any god other than the universe itself. That is our God. Yet true science is receiving enough information today to determine that the universe and the earth are young. That we are, in fact, at the center. Not surprisingly, many try to get out of it. And they're scared. And they're really reaching for something now. By saying what? That there are, guess what? Multiple universes that no one knows anything about, just made up. Thus, the word being abandoned about now is multiverse, which really came from a heretic who was an occultist at the turn of the 17th century. Giordano Bruno. No special place. No special religion. No special universe. You get it? Keep listening. This is important. It may sound silly, but it's extremely important. Having studied seven years in the field of engineering, which requires many classes of physics and various other sciences, I was in love with various new scientific ideas, especially as they were portrayed in TV programs and movies. I was quite religious about watching Star Trek and Star Wars and the like. Anything that was about outer space, I was interested I even dreamed of going out there myself someday. I read many science fiction novels, not just as entertainment, but as motivators to keep striving to do in some fashion what they speak of in dreams. I was living in a bubble. None of it was being brought out in the labs we were working in. 
after a serious conversion by the grace of God, back to the faith when saying my goodbyes and leaving my graduate department to enter religious life, I found a fellow graduate student very puzzled about what I was doing. I asked if he believed in God. He said, I do not. And I asked him, what do you believe in? He said, have you ever watched Star Trek? (laughs) I'm not joking. Those are his exact words. He explained that he wanted that to come true. At one time, I did too. And he was working fit to bust to make that possibility happen. I was not alone in my bubble. Through such means, media, scientific establishment, and other things, many are convinced that there must be life somewhere out there among all the billions of stars and possible planets rotating about them, even though we've never seen one. When we look at the immensity of the universe, we're told that there simply must be life out there. We just can't be all there is. Besides, they're now saying there are other universes. Listen to a modern authority, Miku Kaku. Miku said this in the principle. He says, as soon as you apply the quantum principle to the universe, immediately you get parallel universes. Well, then don't apply the quantum principle to the universe. That's the answer. It doesn't work. But they want to, you see. I want to apply the quantum principle to the universe and you get parallel universes that nobody can see or detect. But think about it, he said, if you do believe in these parallel worlds in space, notice his words, if you believe, you have faith. There's no evidence, no science. This isn't about science. This is about belief. If you do believe in these parallel worlds in space, the church would say to itself, is there a pope? Is there a trinity? Is there a parallel Christ? Is there parallel saints? How many saints are there in outer space? How many popes? Which pope has religious jurisdiction over any other pope? The mind goes crazy thinking of these religious implications of parallel worlds, end quote. Mine doesn't, because they are pure fantasy. It's clear to me they are escaping. It is either this universe with the earth and the church at its center built on the rock that does not move, or it's the multiverse, which allows multi-religions, which allows multi-marriages. You see? You see what's going on? The scientists stopped being scientists and have gone in for dreams and imaginings and even occult inspirations. Giordano Bruno was into the occult. All his writings are just lots of occult stuff bubbling up. In any case, they have sought what is too sublime for them and beyond their strength. Why? Because they have very limited tools, namely only what can they can sense through scientific instruments. When tallied at the end of the day, this isn't very much. Thus the reason we all like to dream and have worlds like Star Trek to turn on. What do we have, folks? We have the faith. That's what we have. And it's awesome. We have divine revelation. We have messages from heaven that are sure and complete. We have solid theology and solid philosophy. We have the words of heaven. Nothing is more certain than our faith. And divine revelation is without error. And that revelation comes to our aid. We can look up and rejoice in the things that are said to us from heaven while the scientific establishment may belittle them and flee to hide under the mountains. They have nothing but what comes up from downstairs. And it smells like the sewer. It really is. Is there life elsewhere in the universe? And the answer is yes. The angels are alive, and the good angels have freedom to traverse the entire universe. Nothing is hidden from them. The demons are bound in hell unless given permission to come out. Some of the church's greatest theologians and doctors like Thomas Aquinas have long taught that various angels are assigned to govern the heavenly bodies of the universe. Remember Palau saying that there's more angels than there are stars in the heaven? Because all the stars were assigned an angel to govern them. 
Can this be why we see stars fail? They're called supernovas because not all the angels obeyed. When some of the damned angels were called to be there, they're not, and things fall apart. Moreover, perhaps this is why sacred scripture speaks of angels as stars and how a third of them were swept from the sky. His tail swept a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Besides that, the church calls the angels heavens in the preface and the Deum. In the prophecy of Baruch, we hear this. He, he that sendeth forth the light and it goeth and hath called it and it obeyeth him and with trembling. Notice what he says, the light. Remember the first day, let there be light. It goes on. And the stars have given light in their watches and rejoiced. They were called and they said, here we are. And with cheerfulness, they have shined forth to him that made them. But what about other kinds of life like us? Things that have a body and soul, aliens, Martians, whatever. Be assured the various space administrations around the world are fitting to bust trying to prove that there is at least some microscopic form of life somewhere else than here. And that is why we're spending lots and lots and lots of our hard-earned money trying to get to Mars and the moons of Jupiter and Saturn when they should be helping us get from city to city and widening and straightening out our roads. But notice that when they get the information back from these places, the topic always rotates around whether there may be life there or not. So far, nothing has shown up. But even the astronomers are getting impatient with the knowledge that they pick up by the senses and are turning more and more to imaginative mathematics to propose strange and wild theories that match modern art, modern culture, and modern politics. Weird, bizarre, and grasping. In any case, to answer the question of life like our own found elsewhere, we have to consider our sources and a few facts. The highest source we have is divine revelation, which includes sacred tradition and sacred scripture. In all of divine revelation, there does not even seem to be a hint of rational beings other than humans and angels in God's universe. Take, for example, all the visions of heaven, both in the Old Testament and the New, and we can add on to those all that the saints have seen. And they all are unified. We only see angels and men in them. With the exception of four living creatures that you heard at the beginning of this conference. And they are clearly symbolic. They are a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Symbolizing the four major Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And as well, they represent the New Testament evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If there is life out there, then they must look just like us. Star Wars is wrong. Star Trek is wrong. Now this brings us to the obvious questions that if there is life on other planets that is rational like us, looks just like us, made in the image of God, are they saved? Or are they all in hell? Since we cannot seem to find any of them in heaven different from us, they must all be down there. Has God hidden them from us? If so, does that mean that there is more than one heaven? Multiverse? Is the multiverse nonsense right after all? Multiverse, multi-heaven, multi-hell? Or perhaps we're in for a big surprise when we get to heaven in that we will find all these strange beings there. And divine revelation decided to keep quiet on this matter. And all the saints saw in heaven was not complete. God hid it from us. Or once again, is it possible for all others in the universe to be just like us, human? And so all the people they see in heaven are actually from other planets or somewhere out there. And I'm against this. I'm going to show you why. Our Lord is the firstborn of all creation. And not just those on earth, but of angels too. We also know that he came through the Immaculate Conception. She was needed for all of creation. 
So if in heaven among all those people, St. Paul and St. John C., for example, some are from planets out there, then they too would need Jesus and his mother Mary. No escaping it. This is how the angels got their grace. That's how they fell, the ones that did. They refused it. It was because of their refusal to accept the graces they had received actually came from Christ through his mother. They were created in a state of grace. They were being shown, where did this grace come from? And where is the grace you're going to get to get to heaven going to come from? It's going to come from Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. They thought that they could reach heaven on their own power. They fell into hell, which is below the surface of the earth. The scriptures and the mystics always indicate it as below the earth's surface, frequently calling it the abyss or pit. I call it the sewer system of the universe. Our Lady opened the earth to show the children of Fatima where poor sinners go. If someone out there in the universe is damned, don't you get it? Do they have to come to hell under the earth? Or do they have their own? Is there more than one hell? Our Lord is king of the universe, not just of the earth. Our Lady is queen of the universe and not just of the earth. She is mediatrix of all grace. We have the mass to make this communication with heaven possible. Do they have the mass? They need grace. Where do they get their grace from? If they've not fallen, they would still require the grace of the firstborn of creation, just as the angels did, and how he gave it to them through this. How will they know and how will they receive it? They would have to know all about us, all about terra firma, and yet we will know nothing about them. How can it be that they know all about us and we don't know anything about them? But wait a minute, Father, what about UFOs? Come on. UFOs, it's a proof that there's life on other planets out there. If we study history of the demons and their interaction with men, we can easily see them doing these sorts of things. The Desert Fathers, who had much experience with them, wrote this. It is proved beyond a doubt that there are as many occupations among the unclean spirits as there are among human beings. For it is clear that some of them are such tricksters and jokers that they constantly infest certain places and roads where they do not take delight in tormenting passers-by whom they can deceive, but are content simply with derision and illusions. And they strive to weary them rather than to harm them. They're just happy to distract you and give you your illusions that may tickle your fancy. St. Anthony of the Desert was attacked by demons on a regular basis. They took the shape of many different things, good and bad. Once the devil came as a huge giant that reached up into the clouds. St. Paul declared in his letter to the Ephesians, you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. St. Paul also tells us the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light. St. Paul, or our Lord and Master and our Savior said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from the heaven. Yes, I believe in UFOs. That's a fact. I'm sorry to confess, but it's true. It seems to me that some of them are our own technological advances. Just go to the Air Force Museum in Dayton and you will see a couple of them while others are most likely devils playing tricks on this unbelieving generation. This makes perfect sense because the devils conform themselves to us. They act toward us in accordance with the condition they find us. They form visions to suit our situation. And God has allowed this to happen over and over again in the history of man as a sort of punishment. Don't you get it? Today, the movies, the science is everything. And thus devils are more than happy to give us temptations and tricks to suit our desires, namely some fantastic scientific visions and experiences. And notice 
how quickly the UFO always comes and goes. If they went all that way, they sure didn't stick around very long. Devils cannot sustain things very long. That's a fact. That's why they're quick. Now, why bring all this up? Why make such a point of it? Once again, we must realize that all such things are an attempt to make us think that we're really quite insignificant rather than creatures made by God to enjoy heavenly bliss and to come to heaven and adore him and to know him. It is all a trick of them to break down that we're a society of fellow creatures of angels and men, not Martians. Some say that if he does exist, isn't it more likely that he's just a big watchmaker, winding up the universe and letting it go? Consequently, we're left feeling that it really doesn't matter what we do so much after all. We are really not significant. Therefore, sin and don't worry about it. Practice what religion you like, if any at all, that suits you. Just be sure to love It's no big deal. Such attitudes underlie much of the scientific establishment, if not plain out atheism. Thus, as already stated, behind much of their fantastic propositions, and they're getting more and more so as we go along, is an effort to explain and propose matters that are beyond their competence. It's about belief, not about true science. Rather than just a tiny little planet on the backwoods of the universe leading us to ask whether God really cares about us, we truly are the apple of his eye. We're the center of creation. He tells us this over and over. And he became man here. And he became man here to die and rise and lead a society back to heaven. Heaven shows us this truth. Looking up into heaven saves us from falling for the errors and distractions like these. Thank you, heaven. Now let us summarize what we've learned tonight. Heaven is a society, a holy society. First and foremost, it is the Holy Trinity. Second of all, it is the angels and the saints. They all love God and they all love truth and hate heresy. They hate sin and they hate error. We should practice for heaven by working within the society of the church militant. We should work within our families, within our parish. There's no running away when practicing for heaven. That's the first thing. Number two, heaven is the church triumphant. They are the same thing. Everyone there is saved. To be counted among them, we must be incorporated into the body of Christ, the Holy Catholic Church on earth. As the creed says, he who refuses to enter the church cannot be saved. The Athanasian Creed. He who refuses to have the church as his mother cannot have God as his father, says St. Cyprian. This requires humility. St. Anthony, during mental prayer, saw the entire earth covered with nets. A good description of our time. You look at all the nets around here. W, 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 whatever. He thought to himself in seeing all these nets, he says, who can escape so many snares? And the heavenly voice replied, only the humble soul. Only the humble soul. Number three. There's only one Lord. There's only one faith. There's only one baptism, one church, one heaven, one universe. There in heaven, we find angels and men seeing and adoring God. There are no aliens in heaven. We are the apple of his eye. We matter. He came here. And finally, there is no universal salvation The devil and the demons are damned, and that is forever. They're not going to get out. They're going to be locked up. The mystical body is not the universe. Rather, the universe is the cosmic palace for the bride of Christ, the church. They're not the same thing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.